Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Hi, my name is Daniel, and I'm an alcoholic. That part was easy because there was this little thing right here that said, my name is blank. I'm an alcoholic. <laughs> so uh, sooner or later, my heart will stop beating out my chest, and I'll uh, be able to share something maybe. But uh, my sobriety date is August 8th of 1998. Um, my home group is the east side group of Alcoholics Anonymous in Benton, Arkansas. And uh, we're otherwise known as the Benton Mafia because if you leave, you die. <laughs> and uh, so, uh, first of all, I'd like to thank the committee, Katya, uh, for asking me to share at Icky Paw. I've got to, I've got to say this: Icky Paw has given a lot to me. Um, just in the way of, you know, I, my first Icky Paw was Houston uh, in 1999, and uh, I come from a small town in Benton, and I was in Arkansas, and I was the only young person in that town for several years after I got sober, to get sober. And there were, I'm close to Little Rock, and there were only a handful of sober in Little Rock that were young, you know, what we would consider young back then. Um, and to get to an icky paw and uh, see the throngs of crazy young people having fun and celebrating sobriety, you know, that's what this is to me. This is a celebration that this program works and that we can have fun doing it. So, I, I mean, it just really got me on fire, and I got involved with, with uh, our state convention, Archipaw. And uh, it, it's got a catchy name, doesn't it? <laughs> but, uh, it is the, the best young people's conference. I'm sorry, but anyways, uh, I'm going to share, you know, emotional sobriety. Uh, I got asked to speak on this topic. I believe Katya called me, and like promptly an hour later, I got more emotionally disturbed than I had been about, <laughs> in about like, uh, like, in, and literally like in about the past five years, uh, it was serious business and uh, situation. I'm not going to go into detail, but I wanted to, people to die, and uh, it was bad, and uh, making preparations to go to prison and stuff like that. And, uh, I mean, that's how fast my shit, <laughs> my shit works, you know. I'll, I'll share a little bit about that. But anyways, now I call my sponsor and, uh, I'm, t- I'm telling him this whole deal and how I've got this, I mean, how my, you know, shit's going crazy. And, and I'm like, oh yeah, and guess what? I got asked to speak on emo- emotional sobriety <laughs> at Icky Paw. And, and he had the same reaction. He like, I think he fell out of his chair laughing though, but, uh, <laughs> He's prone to do that. And that's the uh, same reaction I've been getting from everybody I tell. Uh, <laughs> people just laugh. I don't know what it is. I guess, uh, you, know, you know, I'm not real in touch with my emotions, maybe. I don't know. But uh, and, and what is emotional sobriety anyway? So, you know, I've done some meditating on that, did some studying. I was talking with some of the other panelists. But uh, I'm just going to share some of my experience. That's all I've got. You know, I'm going to share some of my experience, and uh, I hope Kaj or you're not Kaj. Yeah. I hope you like slap me when I got about five minutes left, because I've I've been known to like talk real slow. I, you know, I'm a little burnt still and talk slow, so I don't say much. You know, it, and uh, anyways, I may I may be prone to go like long or whatever, so just holler at me. So anyways, uh. My first memories, I was thinking about this, uh, emotional sobriety. My first memories as a child were of being disturbed. My favorite, uh, you know, I made a few notes and I've got like a few words, like in big bold letters. Uh, first of all, I gotta tell you, I just talked to my sponsor before this. He told me to be honest, be brief and be seated. And I'm going to do that to the best of my ability. And I've asked God to help me do that. But I've, I've got these key words on my little cheat sheet here I made that, 
disturbed is like the big one. That's my favorite word in all of AA literature because I can relate to that. Uh, you know, I, I don't always know. I mean, even today, uh, I've worked several inventories. I've worked the steps with many sponsees. I understand how the process works and resentments, fear, guilt, and shame, and sex inventory. But uh, I get screwed up in the head, and I and I don't know what's going on. I just call my sponsor and say, man, I'm screwed up in the head. And uh, he'll say, like, well, you know, sounds like a resentment or whatever. So, I mean, I know when I'm disturbed. I can relate to that word. You know, it's like, I, hey, I am disturbed. I don't, <laughs> you know, so. Uh, but anyways, my earliest memories as a child is being disturbed. And the, the earliest memory I have, I have an older sister. She was like the boss of your older sister. And uh, we always had to play games that she wanted to play because she's the boss. And uh, so we had to play, like, tea party and shit like that. And, uh, and uh, you know, when I would rather just been out in the yard digging a hole, you know, whatever little whatever little, little boys do. And, then, you know, and then I, as I grew up, the main thing I remember as being a kid and, and, and whatever, you know, before I started drinking was this horrible not-in-my-gut anxiety. Just, it was absolutely horrible. Uh, the, you know, all the feelings of not fitting in and all that. And, uh, so it, it, that was the, the, the main thing I, that sticks out when I think of being a kid is this, is this horrible anxiety that's not in my gut that just never went away. And when I started drinking, it went away. And it was awesome. You know, alcohol saved my life. And, uh, and, and I was okay. And I decided I was going to do it every chance I got. And that's what I did. And it worked uh, for se- for several years. You know, and I did a lot of drugs, too. And I call them drugs, you know. A lot of people call them outside issues, but we didn't call them outside issues back then. <laughs> and uh, I got, you know, I got, uh, I'm not going to share a whole lot of my drunk log and everything about how I got sober. But my, I'll just say this. My brain was completely gone when I got to AA and all this AA lingo. I got really confused. And so they would talk about outside issues and smoking outside issues and Snorting them and shoving them places. I'm like, man, what the fuck are they talking about? Like, I would have done that shit if I'd have known about it. So, uh, <laughs> it's just code for drugs, you know. So I say drugs for the benefit of the newcomer. I don't know. Uh, you know, I've, I've, uh, I've, I have studied the traditions. I have a tremendous respect and love for Alcoholics Anonymous, and I am a real alcoholic. That also did drugs. That's all I'm gonna say about. It. So, uh, <laughs> anyways, uh, anyway, so the the alcohol and drugs quit working for me, and uh, by the time I was 19, I and what happened when they quit working is I went absolutely psycho because I I had this solution, this uh, this way of life that worked, kind of, you know. <laughs> I'm disturbed all the time. I get this knot in my gut all the time. But if I drink, I'm okay. And uh, when that quit working, uh, you talk about Jekyll and Hyde. I was already like Jekyll and Hyde, but when the alcohol quit working, it was like all this hatred I had inside of me and everything, it just it came out. And uh, this psychotic fear I had, it just came out. And it and I, it got so bad, I, could, I literally couldn't go out in public without going to jail for about the last three or four months because people would look at me wrong and I would attack them. And uh, just craziness. Stuff like that. So, anyways, I, on August 8th of 98, that's my sobriety date, I came out of a three-day blackout, been trying to drink myself to death, and because uh, that's the best thing I could come up with on how to straighten my life out. And, uh, and I realized I can't even freaking drink myself to death. So I said this prayer to a God I didn't really believe would help me or whatever, didn't know if it existed. You know, God help me or let me die. And uh, I ended up in jail 10 minutes later. Getting arrested 10 minutes later. And, uh, this time they kept me for like five or six days. And, you know, usually it was just stupid drunken disorder crap that I'd go to DWI. But, and this was too, but this time they, they kept me and I went through, uh, severe DTs, crappie flop, what I had a sponsee call it one time. And, uh, came out of that and I had a, I had an experience in there where I came to and I was in this fog and I didn't know where I was in this, uh, trustee i asked him you know where the hell are we we need to get out of here he said you died and you're in hell now and you're never getting out and i believed him 100 percent and uh and that was when i hit bottom and it you know it was this absolute feeling of complete hopelessness and uh 
and I know that this topic is emotional sobriety, and I'm and I'm sharing like how I got sober and stuff. The only reason I wanted to share all that is because when I stepped out of that jail uh, with five days of not drinking, okay, I could not tell you what my name was. My brain was completely shut down. I thought that I had died and gone to hell. It made complete sense to me. I died in a blackout. This is hell. You know, uh, my family uh, got me and took me to a uh, detox. And, uh, and I'm serious. This is without having drank or done anything for five days. They say that uh, I couldn't I couldn't talk back since they thought I was going to be a vegetable the rest of my life. You know, I've been I've, I did permanent damage to my body. Uh, I'm not going to share a bunch about that, but if I go to twitching up here, it's it's okay. It's uh, <laughs> seriously, you know, it may happen. I uh, I you know I damaged my nervous system, and I've seen the MRIs of where my brain damage is. You know, and, I, and I've had the neurologist tell me that look, you see that part. That's the part where if you'd have kept drinking like another two weeks like that, you would have been a permanent wet brain, you know. So I just say all that to say that never in my wildest dreams, (laughs) psychotic episodes, uh, would I think that I would be having anything to share about emotional sobriety. And if you're new, this is what I really want to share. I went through detox, and I got in this treatment center by the grace of God, a uh, guy named Joe McQuainy ran that treatment center, and uh, he's he's passed on to the big meeting in the sky. But he had a gift to help to help drunks, kind of like Bill and Bob. You know, I mean, you know, some people just have a gift, and they were able to break it down where I could do it, not where I understood it, not where I thought it would work for me. But they broke it down to where I could do it, and I did that first, fourth, and fifth step, and it was complete trash. All right. If if I looked at it today, I I hadn't drank in about three weeks when I did my first inventory, and uh, I could barely read, understand. I mean, and it was it was complete trash, but it was the best I could do, and it kept me sober. And that's where emotional sobriety began for me. And if you don't think this program will work, just work it. I don't give a damn where you're at mentally where you're at with whatever kind of ailment you think is going to keep you from getting this program successfully, because I knew it wasn't going to work for me. I was convinced, like my family, that I was going to be in an institution the rest of my life. But uh, anyways, I slowly came out of that, and uh, and the steps worked. And, you know, uh, as fate would have it, or my higher power, I believe, you know, I got a sponsor when I got out of there that we went back through the steps. And then at you know, about a year and a half or two years sober, he's like, man, you, you kind of can think straight now and everything, so let's do it again, you know. And uh, and so that's what I've done. And uh, here, here's an interesting, interesting part of my first inventory. This is the part that really clicked for me because I had this insane amount of hatred when I got sober. Uh, people had done me wrong, you know. And I had this, they were explaining to me, this is how you do an inventory. And they kept it real simple. They were like, you're going to do it one column at a time. You're going to start with resentments. You're going to list all the people you have resentment. Then you're going to go on to column two. And I was like, hold up. This first column, resentment, is that like all the people I want to die? And uh, my first part said, yeah, yeah, that's it. And I reached in my wallet and pulled out this list. And I was like, man, I got this. And uh, well, I got this shit. And uh I don't, I don't remember, I, don't, I really had, I, I still got that somewhere, it's, it's hilarious, it, uh, it's hilarious to look at now because it's all like in code, I mean, I was so screwed up in the head, it was bad, it, but uh, I mean, that's the level of hatred I had, and I, and I, and I got to tell you something about resentment, uh, I don't remember making that list, I was a blackout drunk, but I do remember coming out of a blackout one day out in the woods. It was probably maybe two or three weeks before I ended up getting sober, but with a shotgun in my mouth and uh, thinking, man, uh, I got this list. And uh, and I also got this crop of marijuana that's fixing to be ready to harvest. And uh, I, can't, I can't pull this trigger till after harvest time and all these people die. So, I mean... Uh, you know, that's, that's just, 
Isn't it amazing the things people find funny? I mean, this shit. I mean, I, mean, I, I, I can see the humor in that, but it's like, uh, I love it. Yeah. Anyways, resentments kept me alive that day and that crop of marijuana that I never got to harvest. I, you know, thank God there was one guy in this plant that knew where every one of my plants was or I'd still be in prison. So, uh, anyways, you know, moving on, I got to, I got to tell you about the power of God working through the steps. All right. I had, I had the list of people that had to die. I had overwhelming fear. And all this guilt and shame. And like I said, I've done uh, many inventories. I've, You know, Joe used to do a step study while he was alive every Monday night at Wolf Street. And I went every Monday for about four years. You know, I understand the process. But I can't explain to you how I can want to kill somebody for like five years and do this simple little inventory process and follow some other directions in the book and from my sponsor. And within a few weeks, I'm able to look at that person as, you know, perhaps they're spiritually sick like I am. And not have any hatred in my heart. Uh, that is a miraculous power of God working through these steps in my life. And for the, and for anybody that's new or anybody that may be confused like me on this topic of emotional sobriety, uh, what I want to share with you is that emotional sobriety is a byproduct of working the 12 steps. That's, that's what it is in my life. It's no like, uh, secret deal that once you work the steps, then okay, now we've got this advanced shit. Now we're going to do this. <laughs> Emotional sobriety. It's like, it's just, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's a, it's what you get, you know, it's what you get when you work the steps and you get, you get cleaned up on the inside and then you're, you're okay. You know, just like I was when I drank the first time and I was okay. You know, now I work these steps and I'm okay. And it's for real. It's for real, you know, and so, uh, like I said, I love that word disturbed. And, uh, and how much time have I got? Ten minutes. All right. I must have been five minimum, ten maximum. See, now you gave me a choice. I don't know. I'm gonna to, I, will say, I, I will. I will try to wrap it up because I want to give these guys time to share. Uh, but anyways, uh, I gotta explain to you how fast my brain can work and how and how this uh, emotional sobriety to me works. Okay, through the inventory process, through the process of working the steps. And the teachings of my sponsor and our literature, uh, we have these things called instincts. Okay, it talks about it in detail in the 12 and 12. Natural basic instincts God gave us for social, whatever, companionship, prestige, pride, self-esteem. We have sex instincts, you know. Uh, we have uh, security instincts. And uh, this is what makes me tick in life. You know, and uh, when I get disturbed, it's because I'm trying to run the show with all these instincts. I'm trying to get more than my fair share, or maybe I'm not even thinking I'm trying to get more than my fair share. Most of the time, it's like good intentions, like I need this much money. I need this many friends. I need this much sex. And that's not unreasonable. You know, it's like that's, <laughs> that's a good idea, you know. And, uh, but, but, you know, but then the thing is, then I go out and I'm like, somebody will say something and I take it the wrong way. And I'm like, man, they're, they're screwing with my shit. You know, they're screwing (laughs) with my master plan that they don't even know about, but they should know about, (laughs) you know, I mean, it's just, and it gets crazy. And so then like, I get resentments that these people, they're interfering with my master plan. And then I get, um, fear. You know, that it's not going to all work out like I've got it planned. And then I get guilt when I go out and uh, take actions that I shouldn't to make things happen. And uh, and this is where all my disturbance comes from. And uh, I've learned that, you know. And the the trick is that I can never recognize it in the moment. You know, <laughs> you know it's just like, damn, somebody did something. Now I'm disturbed. And now I, you know, got to go through the deal, call my sponsor, do the tent step, and like, here, dumb ass, you know, this is what... <laughs> Uh, I heard somebody this weekend say their sponsors didn't talk to him like that, and mine does. I don't, you know, it's fine with me. I mean, that's what I understand. I don't, you know, I, that's how they got through to me when I was new. Is they like screamed at me, like in a, and I was young. Like I said, they told me like, "Crap, you're not gonna make it. You're too young. You ain't been around the block." And, I mean, that shit just fired me up, and I got uh, 
anyways, uh, that's, I'm straying off of the emotional topic, but, but it, this thing is like, uh, works at light speed for me. Cause like these, uh, instincts, like, okay, take work. For example, I'm self-employed. I have been for many years. I'm a carpenter. I do construction work. If any of y'all have like been alive last few years, you know that that market's not doing that good. And, uh, so, you know, I'll have all these, uh, prospects for work and everything and I'll be like yeah I'm going to do that job and I'll and I'll be able to breathe a little bit and maybe get ahead and whatever and then something will fall through and I'll be like oh shit and within like 30 seconds I've gone to everything's going to be okay I'm okay right here right now to man my grandkids are screwed you know they're going <laughs> to they're going to have a tough life and it's like how does that how does that happen how do I get from there to there you know and uh and it, it's really freaking amazing because it's like I've I've got this awesome beautiful wife in the back there that's also an alcoholic that has a strong program, but she's an alcoholic. And I have a son now, and uh, he's love of my life, but he's he's two years old, and I'm like, you know, I mean, how does this how, how do I go from A to B? And it's like so fast, I can't even hardly really explain it. But it's like, oh shit, I'm gonna be broke this month. Then no no no, and then it's like uh. At some point, I get to thinking about my family dynamic and how we're genetically predisposed, so why it's screwed. He's going to be a drunk. He's going to have kids. I'm going to end up raising his kids. My grandkids are going to be like screwed. And like, it's just, it's, uh, I mean, that's, that's like how, how fast it worked. I mean, like, in 30 seconds, why it's like locked up in a federal prison, not just any prison, a federal prison. For brain, you know, I mean, I already know what he did and everything, and I've got his kids, and uh, they're starving because I, you know, I mean, it's just amazing, and uh, and and now uh, I know I'm running out of time, so I got to bust this out on you, but we got this new AA lingo, all right, some new code, and uh, this was developed on an AA job site, and uh, that is an awesome thing. If you've never, I, I mean, I don't know if any of y'all are in construction, but I haven't owned my own business for like nine years now and uh, doing construction. I, I get the pleasure to hire these drunks. <laughs> and man, drunks are, are badass workers. I mean, I, I mean, most of y'all know, I mean, if a drunk will show up, they're going to work their ass off because the ego's involved. And, uh, and I mean, we, but we have a lot of fun, but I mean, we, you know, construction guys, we, you know, the way we might have fun and make the day go by is we mess with each other all day long. And, uh, I got, I had this guy and he, he was, he was coming back into the program and he's just, and one of my other guys has been sober for a while. We're just watching this guy and you could tell he was just deeply disturbed, deeply disturbed. And the day goes on and on and on. Five minutes, thank you. All right, I'll try to wrap it up. But, uh, day goes on and on and, uh, this guy just like, I mean, you could just tell, you could see it in his face. And, uh, this, this, my buddy said, man, you got the squirrels going wild up in there, don't you? And, uh, <laughs> or, uh, that shit, that is, that is stuck ever since. So, I mean, it's like, I mean, it's just perfect description. Disturbed squirrels going wild. I get the squirrels going wild. I know I got to call my sponsor. I know I got, and, and here's the beauty of the deal. All right, I'm going to wrap it up. Here's the beauty of the deal, all right? That when I get disturbed, when I get the squirrels going wild, I've, it's very simple what what we do at this point in my sobriety is the tenth step. And the tenth step, there's four simple directions. I call someone immediately. I usually choose to call my sponsor. I make amends quickly if I've harmed anybody. I ask God to remove it, and I immediately turn my thoughts to someone I can help. And those four things are so simple that I can actually remember them. And if nothing else, I, I can remember the first one, which is call somebody. And the 12 and 12 says, anytime I'm disturbed, there's something the matter with me. And that means I need to do the 10th step. So it's like, I got to keep it simple. So when the squirrels go wild, you know, I got to call somebody. And if, and if I can't even remember the other three things, he'll remind me. You know, I mean, and it's simple, but here's the beauty of the whole deal is that it works. It actually works. It has never failed to work for me. Okay. I've had times, uh, like I said, uh, I've, I have a few medical issues. They're not, they're not real serious, but they're never going to go away. I did do permanent damage myself and I've, 
I've been through periods of my sobriety where because of that I've had uh, uh, issues with anxiety and fear and panic attacks. And I don't know if any of y'all have ever dealt with panic attacks, but I got to a point at one point where I was having panic attacks about having panic attacks. And now I'd have like anxiety about, oh shit, I might have a panic attack about worrying about having a panic attack. And it was, uh, and it was absolutely horrible. So I was doing this t- intense step constantly. And the part in the book that talks about fear and talks about trusting an infinite God rather than my finite self. And it talks about asking God to remove my fear and direct my attention to what you would have me to, me to do it. And at once we commence to outgrow fear. And the thing is, it's not always like that, but at once I commence to outgrow it, and it always goes away. It always goes away. Whatever this disturbance is always goes away when I do that 10-step. So one more thing, and I promise I'll sit down. But uh, the the main thing is, all right, this, this is what my sponsor tells me when I call him in these times of, of squirrel rights and disturbance, deep, dark disturbances. <laughs> Is, uh, you know, we do, we do the 10th step and then he says, but Daniel, how is it right now? He said, read how it works. It says, there is one who has all power. That one is God. May you find him now. That means right now in this moment. That doesn't mean, you know, before or after. That means right now. And, uh, how is it right now? And every time he's asked me that, it's been okay right now. That's what, that's what's really amazing. It's, it's been okay right now. And I love Earl. The circuit speaker from out on the West Coast, he was the first guy I ever heard on tape, and he used to talk about, you know, everything's okay right here right now. I've got I've got enough money to get through today. I've got enough tobacco in my room to last me all weekend. You know, I'm like ahead of the game, you know. I've got a, a room full of friends. I mean, everything's okay right here right now. And I look at... Uh, and I look at people like, I look at, at children, I look at my son, Wyatt, who like, I'm missing something fierce right now because I hadn't seen him since Tuesday. But I think about him and I look at him and he doesn't sit there and worry about, you know, uh, all this crap, you know, that I worry about. And I think that's, that's the way, uh, that I should be with my, with my higher power. You know, I should have that trust of a child, that faith of a child, you know, that things are going to be okay. And, uh, so anyways, uh, I need to shut up, but thank you for paying attention. And- Janine and I am an alcoholic. Fucking love you guys. Um, I'm taking off my shoes because I'm sweating out of them anyway. Um, I'm really nervous. Um, I know it's really hot that I just said that out loud. Um, so, uh, my name's Janine. I am an alcoholic. My sobriety date is June 30th, 2002. Um, I have a sponsor. I am sponsored. I have a home group. Um, I actually am such an alcoholic. I have two. Um, and, uh, I would love to invite you guys, if you're ever in Birmingham, Alabama, Sunday night, 6 o'clock, we just started a Young Timers meeting. Um, it is part of the resurgence of Alkipa, which I'm really sorry to say is going to be the best name ever. Um, <laughs> um, it's, a, it's been a dormant conference for, what, 16, 17 years now? 17. And um, I am blessed and honored to serve as the chairperson for the advisory council um, that is trying to help bring it back um, and there's a great group of young people all through the state of Alabama, and I'm really excited that I moved there um, about nine months ago to meet them. Um, and I also am really blessed that a lot of my friends from Connecticut, where I got sober, are here today. Um, and I'm really emotional, so this is appropriate that this is emotional sobriety. Um, so I brought a book. Um, it's called Emotional Sobriety, The Next Frontier. Um, when I got asked to be on this panel, um, Dan from the... Uh, from the Ikipa committee called and asked me to speak on this. And I was like, do I have to know what that is in order to speak on it? Uh, <laughs> um, and then being the nerd that I am, I went online and got a book. Um, the grapevine puts it out. There's some really good shit in here. Um, <laughs> and I highly recommend it. I'm not going to read to you from it because apparently that's not what I'm supposed to do. Um, but there is some good stuff in here. Um, and I also made notes because 
I'm really, really nervous, um, but a friend of mine wrote all over them and reminded me not to take myself so seriously, so I'm just going to put those away now. Um, so for me, emotional sobriety is acceptance of myself as I am where I am um, and being able to respond appropriately to situations as they occur. Um, and I don't do that perfectly every day, obviously, um, but I'm a lot better than I used to be, and it's as a result of having worked the steps of Alcoholics Anonymous um, and continuing to do that um, as often as possible with anybody who will stand still long enough to listen to me. Um, I, I've had a lot of change in the past year and a half. Um, I work in radio, and I had been working in radio, um, I've been in about 16, 17 years now, and um, had just completely burnt out. Um, I was doing the work of like four people, they kept firing or letting people go and not replacing them, and I kept being the martyr that I am taking on their work. Um, so when it came time to renew my contract, I decided I'm going to go ahead and take my chances and see what God has in store for me. Um, so I decided to leave the only industry that I've ever known, which served me very, very well, drunk and sober. Um, it allowed me to live a lifestyle that was super fun. Um, and then <laughs> I'll leave it at that. Um, and then, you know, it was, it was a lot of fun to work in that industry. Um, but when I left, I literally had no plan. Like they thought I had some sort of like master plan that I was going to go work for some uh, competing radio station or whatever. And I, I was, no, I'm just, I'm just kind of done. And God's got me. Um, and that has, that was the first time ever that I took that kind of leap of faith. Um, and it was the first time ever that I had the clarity that like, really like has already been said that like, everything's going to be okay. Like I've got, you know, food in the fridge. Um, some of it's going bad, but whatever. Um, I've got clothes on my back. They may not fit so great, but whatever. Um, you know, I've got people in my life and if nothing else, because of AA, I'll always have a couch to surf on and, um, I'm going to be okay. I'm going to be okay. And like, was already shared. My brain goes immediately from, you know, I'll be living, you know, doing really well to I'm going to be homeless in Central Park. I don't know why I picked Central Park because I've never lived in New York. Um, <laughs> but just for some reason, it seems like a really nice place to hang out. So, uh, and I went running there yesterday and I saw some of the people that I think I'm going to end up like, and I was just like, well, they look like they might be fun. Like <laughs> maybe they'll make room on their bench for me. I don't know. Um, but anyway, so I took this leap of faith, and for about six months, I had the opportunity to work in the nonprofit sector. Um, literally, I just went, all I know is that God wants me to be of service. Like, when in doubt, be of service. Um, when I first got sober, um, I had a sponsor who I picked because she shared very openly about what she was feeling, and she was very candid about, even though she was, you know, X amount of years sober, um, she still had a hard time fitting in with people. Um, and she still felt anxious a lot of the time around other alcoholics. And, um, one of the tricks that she used was that she, and she gave it to me and I'll give it to you guys, um, is that when you feel like that, go find somebody more pathetic than you and help them. And, um, that was kind of, it became my mantra. Like, and I would, I would wander around looking for the other pathetic kids and I would be like, Hey, you want to hang out? Um, and that was, that was for me how in the beginning, um, I started to make a network and that was for me how I started to learn about service, um, which is for me where I get the relief from my alcoholism, you know, talking to other alcoholics, um, whether it's, you know, making coffee or chairing the Alcupa advisory board or anything in between, um, doing services where I find the relief from my alcoholism. Um, the tricky part about my alcoholism is that I always forget that. And I feel like, oh, my God, you know, i got to figure something out. Um, and I want to apply this massive brain power towards any problem I have in my life. So last year when I left my job, I decided I'm going to do different. Um, and I went and worked in nonprofit for six months. It was awesome. I met a lot of really nice people um, and raised a lot of money for some charities that needed it. And after a while, I was like, this is not what I'm meant to do. Like, I want to go back to what I do for a living. Um, so... I went to a conference and I got honest about what was going on. And it was really hard for me to kind of level my pride and admit like, I miss what I used to do for a living. I'm not a cool kid anymore. <laughs> um, and I got to talk to some people about it and they gave me some recommendations of things to pray for. And I left that conference on a Sunday and I got the job offer for the job I currently have in Birmingham, Alabama on Tuesday. Um, completely out of the blue. It was literally like God said, okay, I was just waiting for you to, to ask. 
And I was like, all right, dude. And like in my life, I call my God dude. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and the dude abides. Um, he is just, <laughs> he's awesome. Um, we were talking recently at a meeting about like our vision of what a higher power is. And it has totally evolved in my sobriety. Now he's kind of like this old professory guy. Um, he's wearing tweed. He looks kind of like George Carlin for some reason. Um, and he like, he's just happy I showed up and like, he just wants to have a conversation. He's very educational. He's gentle. Um, but it's my job to show up. Like they talk about and how it works. You know, God couldn't, what if he were sought? Like my job is to, is to seek. That's my part in that. Um, and I don't know where else to start looking, but AA. Um, so anyway, so God showed up and, and, and a big way offered me basically the dream job that I've always wanted, you know, to do just the parts of the radio in- industry that I love without doing any of the bull crap, being a manager, whatever that I'd always had to do. Um, in my previous work. So I got to like play all day. It was awesome. Um, but the big decision was that I had to leave where I got sober and I'd been there for seven and a half years with these incredible people that made me feel loved and welcome and okay. You know, and I had to give that up in order to professionally be okay. Um, and that was terrifying for me. That was really scary. Um, as an alcoholic, one of my favorite coping mechanisms as an active alcoholic, I mean, um, was I moved a lot. Like when things get hard, I'm out. And, you know, I moved from Maryland, Pennsylvania, Maryland, Pennsylvania, Colorado, Connecticut. Um, I just like to bounce around because like as soon as, as the drama was about to hit, it was like, okay, relocate. Um, and in my industry, you could hide that pretty well. Um, and I never got fired from a job, but it was really, really close. Um, I usually got out before things got bad. Um, but I wanted to stay where I was because for once I had found a place where I connected. I found a place where I was okay no matter what. You know, and, and I had a, a support network that literally like would show up at my door. I lived really close to the center of town and I just kept a key under the flower pot outside my front door and people would stop by with like cheesecake and we'd hang out and eat ridiculous amounts of cupcakes or, you know, just, it, it was awesome. Um, I have a food thing too. Um, <laughs> but anyway, so I had to leave that and I moved to Alabama and, um, despite the fact that it's in the Bible belt, um, I was terrified that God didn't live in Alabama. <laughs> 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 Um, but what happened was I had this girl that sponsored me say, you know, when you get there, promise me you will do a 90 and 90 and, um, okay, I'll do a 90 and 90. And what happened is what always happens. God carried me, you know, AA carried me. I showed up at a meeting and like from that meeting, they recommended another meeting to go to. And then from that meeting, they recommended another meeting to go to. And eventually I got connected with the young people and eventually I got connected with a women's meeting. And eventually I got connected with, um, you know, a meeting that meets every day at noon. So it fits my schedule. And like all this, I mean, it was not that long either. Like all of a sudden I was plugged into this amazing group of people in Birmingham, you know, and God started talking to me through them. Um, but it was really scary. It was really scary. Um, another piece of the story is I had to break off an engagement in order to move down there. Um, and it wasn't because I chose the job over him. Um, the plan had been for him to come with me. Um, but it turned out there was a lot of other issues going on and it was probably not a good idea to transport those across state lines. Um, (laughs) um, so I had like this clean slate, this clean slate. So, you know, I'm provided, um, with this opportunity to start completely over, you know, and I'm a mess. I'm an absolute mess, like just all the time, just in fear because I don't have my people and in, a, in, in fear because I don't get to go sit in the basement of the church where, you know, I feel the most comfortable or whatever. Like I never realized what a creature of habit I'd become. Um, so it, it, I had to change my idea of what it meant to be sober. I had to change my idea of what it meant to be okay. You know, it wasn't just being around the people that I like. Um, it was being okay under all circumstances and responding appropriately. And I made some really big mistakes. Um, because I was newly single, I thought it was clearly a good idea for me to start dating again. And, um, I'm an alcoholic and I like to do that as big and often as possible. And, um, I had this one week where, uh, I thought it was a very successful week for me because I made out with three boys in one week. And, um, (laughs) I'm a girl that likes to kiss. So it was, it was super fun. Um, and then I decided to get honest about it with my sponsor and she called me gross. (laughs) Um, yeah, that was super fun. And I woke up like after having that conversation with her feeling emotionally hungover, like I, those four horsemen that they talk about in a vision for you. Like I felt that in sobriety. Um, you know, I felt the despair, you know, and it was just, it was awful. It was really awful. And I was like, well, what am I supposed to do? Like what? I don't, I don't know how to function. I don't know how to. And 
then it re- occurred to me, go find somebody more pathetic than you and help them. You know, that is, that is always the way to go. And God was awesome and put several sponsees in my life that were going through breakups. Um, because that's how it always works. Um, and I got to walk them through it and then was held responsible for my actions because I had to be an example. <laughs> um, and making out with three boys in one week is not the strongest, most emotionally healthy thing to do. Um, it was, it was amazing. It was amazing how God carried me and how the AA Calvary always comes, you know, if I make myself available for it. Um, you know, I've made friends with my character defects these days. Like when they come up, I'm like, hello, ego, hi, pride, fear, what's up? And like, um, it's gotten to the point now where I can see how, like in the moment I can see what they're doing. Like right before this meeting, um, a bunch of my friends from Connecticut wanted to go out and play in the city and it's gorgeous outside. Of course they want to go out and play in the city. Um, and I was like, dude, have fun. And as soon as they walked away, I'm like, they hate me. (laughs) Like, Oh my God. And then I had, you know, have that moment of panic where I'm like, nobody's going to come and it's going to be awful. And look at you guys. Like you guys are all here and I appreciate it. Um, I would stand in a room and talk to myself. It's not the first time that would have happened, but um, I'm glad I didn't have to. Um, but my exciting news for newcomers is that the periods of crazy and the and the and the peaks and valleys get shorter and shorter and shorter. Um, and these days, like I strive to be boring. Um, like I don't like drama, and it used to be so fun. Um, I used to like get in there and stir shit up and like want to be in it and like. Eat. I wanted to be in your drama. Like I wanted to take that on. I wanted to run the show. I wanted to orchestrate it. I wanted to participate. I wanted to amplify. Um, and these days, like as soon as people start gossiping, as soon as people start like playing that game, I'm like, yeah, I'm good. Like, I, I don't know who that is other than God taking that away from me. Um, you know, and God has repaired the relationships in my life too. Like I had a really contentious relationship with my father growing up. Um, we like to hit each other and we like to, um, yell at each other. And, um, his favorite thing to say was, you know, I know what you're going to do before you even do it. Cause you are me. And like, I didn't consider that a compliment. Um, and the awesome news is that we are now like best friends and that's God. That's God. I, for my whole life, I hated him, you know, like I loved him and hated him at the same time. Like he was like my hero and my enemy. Um, and now like, I just love him. Like, I just love him. Like something in the course of the steps took away the hate. Um, you know, and I respond differently these days when, when things happen, I was thinking as we were sitting here getting ready, um, when we moved when I was a kid from Maryland to Pennsylvania and I was having a really hard time dealing with being the new kid again. And I was like 14. Um, and I took this giant knife to the butcher block in our kitchen and just like whacked at it and left these big chunks out of the Island in our, um, in our kitchen. Um, and didn't think that was weird. Like, didn't think that that would like scare people. And my sister like ran out of the room screaming and called my mom. And, um, it was like, I didn't understand why that wasn't an appropriate response. Um, I was mad. Like there was a thing like problem solved. Right. Um, you know, and now like when I feel anxious, I pray, like, what? Like, who does that? Um, sometimes people have to remind me um, that that's probably a good idea, which is why it's good to have other alcoholics around. Um, but now when, like, something comes up, I have an appropriate emotional response because through doing the steps, like, the resentments are gone. And through doing the steps, the fear has diminished. Um, through doing the steps, like, I kind of know what I look like when I'm acting like an asshole. Like, I know what happens when my character defects pop up. I'm like, <laughs> okay, there it is. Um and it's a much more peaceful way to live. You know, when life is going well, you know, I think God's awesome and he's totally in charge and things are good. When God um, apparently decides I need to work through stuff, like it's harder for me to have that faith. You know, like when I lost a fiance job, support network, you know, moved 1200 miles away, like it was really hard for me to think that that was God's plan. You know, despite the fact that the mountains he had to move in order for that to occur in the first place were immense. I mean, just, it's a long story, but the way the guy that hired me got in touch with me, like the way he found me, cause I hadn't talked to him in 10 years. Like it was crazy. It was crazy. Um, it was, it was very clearly God driven for me to go there. Um, but because I was having a hard time, it was hard for me to see God in it. Um, and I was scared to death. I was scared to death that I was going to move down there, not find my people, not find my community. And I was going to drink. And I know what happens to girls like me when they drink, you know, and I've been around long enough to know that I want to live. You know, and I, and I want to, I want to hold on to the gift that's been given to me. Um, 
So I had two options. I could either get in and work it like I'd been taught from the very beginning. You know, one of the women back uh, in Connecticut says it works if you work it, and if it doesn't work for you, it's because you're not working it, not because it doesn't work. Um, you know, it just, it, it's true. Like, we've, it, it has always worked on everything I've ever tried it on, whether it's been um, an emotional disturbance or a fear or whatever. The steps have always, always worked, and I always, always forget that. I'm always scared that, like, this time is going to be the, the time it didn't work. You know, and I, and I did the steps in the very beginning, um, literally to prove my sponsor wrong. Like I was going to be the one like where they say, rarely have we seen a person fail. I was going to be like, that's totally me. Um, and I thought you guys were going to hate me and kick me out of AA. And that has never happened. You know, I've been to meetings in 15 different states, 16, 17 different states now, um, three different countries, um, all over the world. AA has welcomed me with open arms and made me feel like it's okay. It's okay right now. It's okay where I'm at. Um, and it's, it's going to be okay. Cause no matter what, I've got you guys, you know, that's where I find my emotional sobriety. It's, I, I love what you said about like, it's not, you know, the next part. Um, it's not like grad school or anything like, you know, once you, once you get like technically sober, then you can become emotionally sober. Like for me, like the not drinking, you know, yeah, that's a successful day, but like, that's not enough anymore. Like for me, it's not enough just to be physically dry. You know, I don't, I don't find that as a sufficient replacement for what alcohol used to give me. Like I need the connection that I get from you guys. I need the connection that I've gotten from God. And you know, eight years ago, I never would have thought that I would be up here like God, God, God. Um, cause I hated God when I came in, like I was pissed. Like when I came in here and saw the steps on the wall, it was like, God was in like these big bold letters. Um, and I thought, fuck, I've joined a cult. Like it was, it was not good news. It was not good news for me to think that this was a spiritual program. Um, but it's not just a spiritual part of the program. It's a spiritual program. Like it's a spiritual program of action that works under rough going and it helps us in all circumstances, no matter what. Um, and I've, I've been living proof of that. You know, I've had loss, like, you know, people died and the A Calvary came. Um, you know, I've lost loved ones. Um, I've lost relationships. I've lost places to live. I mean, there's been a lot of loss in my life, but there's also been a lot of, uh, really exciting things that have happened. And you guys have been my champions in those times too, and kept me not only grounded, but like cheered me on. And all I ever wanted was to be one of the cool kids. Like I just wanted to be accepted and loved. Um, and I found that here. I found that here as soon as I made myself available for it. Um, you know, I, I didn't immediately fall in love with AA. Like I came in, it was not good news to be here. Um, I was only here because I didn't want to be in trouble anymore. Um, my best friend, the last friend that I had from, uh, my drinking days, um, had cut me off. She wouldn't put up with my stuff anymore. And she used to be the one I called in the middle of the night or when drama had happened or when I needed to borrow money or whatever. And she was done with me and I literally had nowhere else to turn. Like I didn't come here because I was like, I hear those AA people are nice. Like that wasn't, that wasn't it. Um, these AA people are nice. Um, even when they don't have to be, which is really, really nice, which is really, really cool. Um, and the people that have the kind of sobriety that I want, the people that have what, what I want to copy and emulate and, and hopefully get someday are the people that do service. Um, you know, <laughs> they're like Zen Buddha masters. They're amazing. Um, if you've ever done like area or district level, um, I'll, I'll wrap it up really quick. Um, where I used to live, um, I met the test of willingness. They had nobody that was willing to stand to be the district chairperson. Um, so I said, okay. Um, and I was the youngest person on the officer's board by half. You know, like everybody was in their sixties and up at least. And they all had at least quadruple the sobriety time I did. Like it was insane. It was insane. But I, and like, I was terrified that these people were going to be like these crunchy, grouchy, old, like mean people, whatever. And they were like, we're so glad you're here. Like, don't worry. Things will work out. Like they were so nice. And they were just like, always just like, okay, like we're not going to break AA. It'll be fine. It'll be fine. And like, I want that. Like, I want to know that under all circumstances, things are going to be fine. I want to know that no matter what, God's got this, that you guys have got me. Like, you know, that, that unfailing faith that I see people that do service that they have. Like, it, it blows my mind to watch them. Like, our um, our past delegate in Connecticut, her name's Amalia, and she's just, like, unbelievable. Like, there was this guy that was, like, kind of um, really cranky and kind of verbally... Uh, are very vocally criticizing the way I chaired the meeting like over and over and over again. And she's like, why is he bothering you so much? Like, 
It's okay. Like, he can have an opinion. It's okay. He's not going to break AA. Like, it's okay. Like, eventually, if you just keep doing your job, like, he'll stop coming. <laughs> like, okay. And, like, I did it out of a resentment so that I would be like, ha-ha, like, you stop coming and I'm still here. Joke's on you. Um, but what happened is I fucking love that guy now. Like, because he challenged me to learn how to do this program with even people in the program that drive me nuts. Like he challenged me so that I had to learn how to love everyone. Um, you know, it's, it's been a huge growth process. Like I came in here thinking about nobody but myself. I came in here thinking about, um, what are you guys going to give to me? How can I get more? Um, and now that's not how I think. Like I enjoy being of service. I enjoy not having drama. Um, I enjoy finding the peace and serenity that's available through doing the steps of Alcoholics Anonymous. Like the promises have come true, even when I don't have the stuff that I thought that that meant. You know, the big fancy house, the rich husband, the 17 kids, they'll all adore me. You know, like I, th I thought that that was going to be the life that I had. I was going to adopt a bunch of kids and they were going to be really grateful. It's going to be awesome. Um, <laughs> but like, I don't, I don't have that. Like I'm a single girl living in an apartment in Birmingham, Alabama, and that wasn't on my agenda, but it apparently was on God's. Um, and as was being here. Um, so I'm grateful to all of you for my sobriety. I'm grateful that I was here. I'm grateful that I got asked. Um, I don't know if I talked about the topic or not, but thank you guys, and I'll see you around. I'm Stacy. I'm a grateful alcoholic. the hula part. Um, my sobriety date is October 18, 1987. Um, my sponsor's name is Tom H. My home group is here, the Atlantic Group in Manhattan. I got sober when I was 19. And um, I'm going to try and give you a quick dialogue of how I think I charted my way to emotional sobriety through the steps. Um, I want to thank Katya for asking me to speak. It's really an honor. Um, and Daniel and Janine for doing a wonderful job. And it's good to have you guys here. Welcome to our city. Um, can I borrow your big book for a second? Yeah, go. There's a, when I first got here, my, um, my first sponsor, Eli, who's also at the big meeting in the sky right now, he, um, Some of his books missing. Um, is that a big book? Yeah. I need the doctor's opinion. Yeah. Awesome. No problem. <laughs> okay. So when I when I first got here, um, my sponsor used to have me. We used to sit in the diner every week and we would read together. And literally, this guy would spoon feed me the big book, right? So he started at the copyright line, and I'm like, I never read a forward or anything in my life, and this guy's starting at the copyright line and telling me why that's important. But we got to this one paragraph that we read, and I want to read it because it was it was the first chunk that I could I could embrace. Men and women drink essentially because they like the effect produced by alcohol. The sensation is so elusive that while they admit it is injurious, they cannot, after a time, differentiate the true from the false. To them, their alcoholic life seems the only normal one. They're restless, irritable, and discontented unless they can again, with a sense of ease and comfort, which comes at once by taking a few drinks, drinks which they see others taking with impunity, after they have succumbed to the desire, as so many do, and the phenomenon of craving develops, they pass through the well-known stages of a spree, emerging remorseful with a firm resolution not to drink again. This is repeated over and over, and unless this person can experience an entire psychic change, there's very little hope for their recovery. So when I, when I read that, jokingly with friends when I was out there, I, they'd say, dude, what's your problem? You know, you just go off. You just need to drink a little bit, have fun. You just, and I, and, and I, I was in my first detox at 14 and they said, so 
what is it with you, right? And it and this for whatever reason I didn't I don't I didn't hear the disease concept. I heard you're broken. Why don't you just get your act together? You know what you're putting your parents through and your family through and your grandparents through. And um, they said, what is it? And it was one of these pressure circles where everybody's like jumping on you and it wasn't AA at all. And um, I said, you know what it's like? It's like being a werewolf. And when the moon happens, there's nothing I can do about it. Do you know? There wasn't, there's just nothing I can do about it. It's just boom, there it is. It, it, it can be, I had a bad day. It could be, I had a good day. It could be, she looked at me funny or she smiled. It could be whatever it was. And boom, I was off to the races and I never meant to overshoot the moon, you know, but I always did. And, um, what's that saying? I, I didn't always get in trouble when I was drinking, but every time I got in trouble, I had been drinking. You know, it didn't matter no matter what. That's what would happen to me. So I got here and my relationship. So so in the big book, it says the entire purpose of this book, these steps in this program is to help you find a power greater than yourself to restore you to sanity. It says that in one place. And then it says uh, find a power greater than yourself to to uh, solve your problems. Right. That's what it says. And my first sponsor said, um, Here's the box. You, everybody has, and once he put it in this framework, it really has helped my sobriety. So the box is human beings only have two fears. Fears of losing what we have or not getting what we want. Nothing else. And the fears usually are in the form of finance and romance. That's the box, right? (laughs) And so finance takes care of my outsides. And if I can get enough on the outside, I can get love that way. You'll love me because I got stuff. If not, if you love me, I get love on the insides, and they're both forms of security. And in my instincts that Daniel talked about, those instincts are the thing that give me a sense of being okay. That becomes God, right? A a feeling of well-being, right? And so... Pick up any magazine you want at the nearest newsstand, and there it is. And as a kid, I sat in my room and said, if I just get this, I'll be okay. Mom and dad aren't going to get the divorce. I'm not going to be drinking, all of this stuff. And and it's very easy in our materialistic world to develop that sense of that idea, right? So, like, Daniel really nailed it great. You know, I go into every situation. How can I get what I want? Because I've got these instincts and you don't know I've got this box that I got to fill and I got to fill it with all the stuff. And then when I get all the stuff and I get all the love, I'm going to be okay. Right. And I'm a, I'm a arrive, Right. But it doesn't exist. So there I am out in the world trying to do it. And when you're not fitting the program and all of this, I got a drink to take the edge off because I've got this pressure and See, my name is Stacy, but my head's name is Rufus. And there's this guy who lives in my head. And, he, and um, it's not that my problems are my problems. It's my solutions to my problems that are my problems. <laughs> because if I'm unemployed, I'm going to rob you. I'm going to rob the liquor store. I, I solve problems with guns and violence. You know, that's how those are the, my solutions. And that's that becomes my problem. So when I first got here, God for me was good, orderly, direct. Well, actually, it was a group of drunks. I believe that you believe. I don't know what you had. I didn't get the, the, the like Janine talked about, the panels on the wall and the God stuff. But I believe that you believe. There was something in your eyes that I trusted that, right? That far I could get. And then as my sponsor took me through the big book, he's like, this is a set of good, orderly directions. These are tools. And that will lead you to a a relationship with a higher power. Because at the end of the day, there's only one relationship. It's not with my wife. It's not with my daughter. Before anything, there has to be that one relationship in order to have a relationship with you. If not, my relationship is based on bad motives. Right? Because if I don't have this relationship, then I have another ulterior motive to get what I need to put in that box to make sure I'm going to be okay. And you're either with me or you are against me. And it's, and I, I'm talking to you sizing that up while we're, while we're speaking so I can go, is it, which team is this person on? Right? Are you going to help me get that job or do you love me? You know, so 
there was a group of drunks. There was then good orderly direction. And then God migrated. Today for me is grace over dependency on things. Can I truly, can I truly let go and fall back? Right. Uh, there's that uh, in the second Indiana Jones. There's an invisible. There's an. I work in the movie industry, so pardon my movie puns. But there's there's this point where they have to walk across an invisible bridge that they can't see, and they have to they 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 have to step out on it and then walk across. And what you'll find here, like Janine talked about, these old timers, they know how to freaking levitate. <laughs> it's it's like it's like I couldn't. People would come in and say, I'm here and um, I just lost my husband or my wife and I just had the funeral and I came to a meeting and I called my sponsor this morning, but I'm going to be okay. <laughs> I'd say somebody, I was walking down the street, somebody bumped into me, I got into a fight, I almost went and had a drink, you know. And, 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 and it's not okay and it's never going to be okay, you know. <laughs> and I couldn't understand that, that what was it that they had that was so impenetrable, right? And I didn't know what it was, but I wanted that, right? I got sober originally in Los Angeles and there was this uh, meeting, if you ever get, I don't even know if it's still around, called Architects of Adversity. And... I, my office, I also worked in music back in the day, and, and uh, I, my office was right off of Sunset Boulevard, and I would jump over to that meeting. The business meetings, people would pull out knives, chairs would be flying, like, the, the, and I loved it. There was so much about AA that I loved. I loved, I loved the biker meetings. I loved everything about AA. Ohio Street on a Saturday night, it was fantastic. Malibu meetings, it was great. And so that really spoke to me being in here young and that spirit. But there was a certain point where I heard an old timer say, eventually in AA, everybody's got to move to from the seat where you're getting to the seat where you're giving. Right. And my sobriety had to be based on you and helping you at the end of the day. My world can't be happy until you move to the center of it rather than me being at the center of it, you know. And, and I've got a, God hides himself in the very last step at the last place I'm going to look in a drunk, in a non-selfish act, in an act of love is the only way I can get it back. And, and my 12th step is somebody's first step, right? You know, I'm there and that cycle has to happen. And if that thing's not there, I die, you die, we're all back into the dark ages, as it talks about. Um, the, uh, you know, when I first got here, I was, I was, and I was doing my fourth step with Eli, I realized something, and he kind of clued me into this, that, you know, my native tongue was not English when I got here. It's actually Victimese. And... Um, <laughs> And like Daniel talked about, I had this list of people, right? I didn't even need to write it down because I was telling everybody about it on a regular basis. <laughs> and so I was constantly, yeah, but you don't know, you know, the way you can spot victimese is there's certain buzzwords. Let me explain. <laughs> you don't understand. Um, but listen. Um, <laughs> Well, they started it. Um, there's this whole set of this world where I'm being approached upon, like things are jumping on me. It's not me. It's them. They started it. And I've got I just was defending myself. And I lived my life that way. Everything up to that point was all about that. And then when it happened, it propelled my drinking and using because that's what I use in my dialogue with everything going forward. I would just, I just soiled all the relationships, you know? And, um, so my sponsor started helping me get rid of that language. And one day he had the audacity to make me walk around with an index card and I had to put hash marks for the number of times I talked about myself during the course of a day. He made me do that. And like, and so it, it, it was, 
you know, 20 times like the first day. And then I started, what he was teaching me was to see my thinking. See, meditation is about putting distance between me and Rufus, right? <laughs> and, and what it's doing is, I mean, t- early sobriety is I phone my sponsor from the scene of the crime. <laughs> After I've gone through the steps and I'm working my way through it, I'm phoning him out in front of the house with the gasoline and masters, <laughs> and I'm about to walk in, right? But eventually, I'm calling him when it's a little tiny resentment or even before it can be a resentment, right? Because I start to see, I check my motives before I even get there, right? Right? Because I'm on my knees in the morning making it right with HP before anything ever happens, before I walk into the office, before I pick up the phone. If those deals go south, I'm not going to be vindictive or, you know what I did for you? You know, I'm going to, I'm going to, because I know it'll come back around because as long as I'm of love and service, it's all going to be good. And um, so that that's that thing where I start to get in front of my recovery, you know, not being battered by the world, right? So, um, well, just before I was coming here, right? So my my our daughter is in pre K, and New York schools are crazy, and um, you got to be all interviewed and all of this stuff. And my wife went to see at this open house at this pre K but I couldn't go. And we hadn't talked about money, and she came into the house, and she's, it's great, it's beautiful. When you get back from the conference and speaking, you should run over, and it's so wonderful. I said, how much is it? (laughs) Right? Because today I'm not going to just, yes, honey, and then when the bills come, I resent her and all this other red tape. How much is it? She throws out a number. We can't afford that. And she starts brooding around the house. And she's slamming doors and doing this. But you know what? I was on my knees earlier. And I have the emotional fortitude to know if I don't ask that question now and we start getting in financial stuff, it's six months or a year of us grinding, right? And everything's funny. And then all of a sudden I'm looking at other women and I'm thinking of other, you know, relationships. And I'm I I got the wrong wife in the wrong house on the wrong block with the wrong kid. Right. That's what happens to me. But today I can say, honey, how much is it? You know what? We need to be financially within our means. And I go let her sit with that. And I don't have to I don't have to own her recovery. She's not in the rooms, but. You know, I don't have to own her process, right? And that's that's emotional sobriety for me because I want to people please in my marriage and make sure she's happy, you know, so I can get what I want. <laughs> you guys have dirty minds. <laughs> but But love is also taking care of our house fiscally so that we aren't when the bills come and there's not enough money at each other's throats. That's love too. You know, that's, I've seen AA meetings where we say, we can't do that. We don't have enough money. And some people are mad and upset and okay, we're going to have a bake sale or whatever, but we, we get through it. Right. So I, 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 and I was able to just let it go and I gave her a hug and a kiss and I walked out and I gave my daughter a hug and a kiss and I came here clean and I didn't carry that with me. I wasn't sitting here. I was, at, I was actually in the room listening to the speakers rather than being at home going. <laughs> <laughs> right? I could, I, I remember what they said because I'm actually here in the room, right? Because emotional sobriety for me is my mind, my body, and my spirit are all at the same place at the same time because that's where God lives, right? When, when I'm arguing with you, but I'm at work, but I want to be at the gym, God does not live in yesterday and God does not live in tomorrow. Infinite God lives in the now, and the power of the now is everything, right? Because that's where my higher power lives. 
And when I, when I learn to get away from the other stuff and the trappings, it's so amazing to walk around because you actually see life happening. You remember conversations with people. You know, I was sober here for years that people say, hey, remember when we were talking? And I'm like, I don't even remember this person. <laughs> right? Because they're talking and I'm not even here. Right? And so I love my sponsees when they're brand new and they're early in recovery. And 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 I feel like how my sponsor must have felt because my sponsor got sober the year I was born. You know, so he had 19 years when I'm sitting in front of him wet and shaking, and he had 19 years then. And, you know, it was so amazing. How am I doing on time? Okay. Um, he, he, he said, here's a newcomer. <laughs> highs and lows. He said, here's an old timer. He said, don't let your highs get too high. Don't let your lows get too low. You know, for me, it's not the boulders in the road. It's the pebble in my shoe. Mm -hmm. Right? It's never the, the boulders in the road are great because I milk those to death. <laughs> I lost my job. <laughs> but it's that, it's that. I walked into our office one day and the receptionist, she was reading twilight number six or whatever and she's in her book and she's she's you know gum chewing receptionist and i remember walking in and she doesn't even look up and i i say hey antoinette how's it going she goes great and i went in my office and i had a resentment i had to write my sponsor a 10 step on the fact that the receptionist didn't look up and say hello <laughs> at 22 years of sobriety <laughs> but guess what I wrote that 10 step and my day changed if not I was gonna <sighs> anyway <laughs> her mom runs the office so I have to be nice um, <laughs> so I, 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 I want to just leave you with something real quick which is um, m the table legs of emotional sobriety for me are this. I have to have at least three. I need a sponsor. Well, I need God first. I need a conscious contact with the higher power. I need a sponsor. Check my thinking by. And I need sponsees in order to be of service. I need at least those three. The fellowship, meetings, all that other stuff, just add more legs to the table. But I need at least three. If I don't have those, I'm insane, right? Stone cold nuts. And so a couple of years ago, we live in a studio that's like a straight room, and on the back, back end, there's our bed, and Robin's laughing because she knows this story. So there's this window, and our AC unit sits in the back part of the studio, and on the other side of it, there was this chimney that these people had, and it was an illegal smokestack. It was, we have a pre-war building, so it, it was somebody just put in their own so they could get more rent or whatever. So it sat right outside our window, and when it's really cold in New York, if somebody's running that chimney, it would pull smoke into our apartment. And we have a little two-year-old daughter, and so I have to choose between smoke and, and coughing or, or the cold and whatever. And so these, this couple is pretty nice, but every now and then they get their chimney going and the wind's coming off the Hudson in the right way. And this one particular night two years ago, I went over, knocked on their did hit their buzzer, and the, the husband comes on all the time. He's like, oh, hi, the last log is on. The fire will be out in a minute. Very sorry, you know, just kind of. And I say, okay, but please, you know, and, I, and I'm, I'm trying to be a good AA. And this one particular time, his wife grabs the intercom and says, Dad, we just bought a whole new, you know, bunch of logs, and we're going to burn all the logs we want, and you need to get your apartment properly insulated. That's not our problem, and don't ever buzz our buzzer again. <laughs> so you know how you don't remember walking home? Like, like I, I, I don't even remember walking home, and... 
there's this tall ladder that we have to change light bulbs in the in the main lobby. There's a tall. So I've got this tall yellow ladder, and I'm placing it across the building. Now there, there's a we're on the third floor, so there's a drop, right? And my my wife is looking at me. She goes, "What are you doing?" And I go, "Mind your business." And, and, I, and, I, and I put the ladder. I put the ladder on the other building, and I've got a cinder block, and I'm going to put it on their flute, and back up their house with smoke. And we're gonna we're gonna talk about smoke in people's houses. We're gonna have a conversation on the roof in the snow, right? And because my family's freezing. My daughter's got a cold, and so we're going to talk about this. Stone cold sober. I got 20 years sober. I prayed that morning. I, t- I called my sponsor. So anyway, so I, I, I lay the ladder over, and my wife says, and I won't curse here, call your freaking sponsor as as I'm about to go on this ladder across the building. And I say, I'll call him, and I dial a number, and I call, and I get Tom on the phone, and I explain the situation to him, how I've been victimized and my family's in trouble. And he says, put the ladder back and call me tomorrow. So I take the ladder back down, and, and my wife, what did your sponsor say? I said, we're not talking about it. And I take the, I put the ladder back, right? Now, here, here comes the twist. I put the ladder back, and I call my sponsor the next day. And he says, would you, I, he listens to me rant, and he says, would you like some sober direction? I say, sure. He said, why don't you write a letter to the buildings department? and take photos and go through a normal process, get dressed in a suit and go, but yeah, I've done that. It doesn't work. You don't understand. <laughs> so, so I do what he says. I take pictures. I take pictures of the stack. I, I go and I take pictures of my daughter where we've got plastic bags on our door to keep smoke from coming in. And I get dressed like you taught me in AA. And I go to the buildings department and I type the letter up and I take the photos and I walk in and I go up to the top floor. I, go, I, I literally went on the website and said, who's in charge? And I just went. I wrote it to them and I just went. There's a receptionist who goes, do you have an appointment? I go, no. Said. I'm bringing this. Here's a situation. She goes, okay, we'll have someone call you. And I thought, see, it didn't work. And I left. And this woman calls me, the assistant of the head of the buildings department of all of New York City. And she says, how old is your daughter? I'm looking at pictures of her. I said, she's two. And this is what's happening. She says, I'm going to take care of this. We'll get it handled right away. My wife calls me and says, there's a, a building inspector on top of the building right now with the manager. That was on, that's, that's on Tuesday, right? I went on Monday. That was on Tuesday. On Friday, they fined them $2,000 and they made them cement seal the, the chimney right there and fined them two grand and said, if you ever open this again, you're going to be fined like $50,000 or something. And my wife was like, you're my hero, right? And, and we had been trying to do that for years. At 20 years, my best thinking was Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.